Good morning and welcome to Animal Talk Thursdays. I'm Don Heyman, animal communicator and co-founder of Spring Farm Cares. And we're thrilled to have you with us today. If you have a chance to uh, drop us a note in the comment section um, about where, where you're listening from, because we love to know where we're getting our listeners from and where you are. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start our session for today. Becca? Awesome. Hi, everybody. So we have gotten some really good questions uh, over the past few weeks. I think the first one we'll start with is, are animals aware of an afterlife like we are, and do they think about it while they're alive? Okay. This is a this question will take a little bit of answering to answer this, um, because um, let me start by answering this the way one of our horses once answered it. When somebody asked, do animals believe in reincarnation? And the horse's answer was, do humans believe in breathing? And... Um, you know, it was like, what does that mean? It was like, it's as ridiculous a question. So in in that horse's opinion, um, that she said, there's nothing to believe or not to believe. You just do it. Um, and it just happens. So yes, animals, um, often when I'm talking to animals over my career, I, I will get some past life information. I personally have had animals that I am convinced 100% that are animals that I've had before. We've had numerous animals at Spring Farm come back. Um, where even our staff was like, hey, I think this is, <laughs> you know, somebody else. Um, because it was just too uncanny. And it's not that they looked like the other animal, but they had the same mannerisms. They did the same things. They laid in the same places. You know, they, you just know when you have one of those, um, they're really special, obviously. Uh, but anyway, they, um, animals are oftentimes aware of their past lives, but it's, particularly true when it's affecting something in their current life. So we humans get hung up on this past life thing. Um, and this was what prompted the horse to say, uh, you know, why, do, you know, why do you, you don't believe in it? I mean, it's just, you, there's nothing to believe or not to believe. You just do it. Um, with humans, we, t I notice a lot of animal communicators, especially when they're first starting out, will really go after this uh, past life thing. And sometimes we miss because we're looking for something more dramatic in a story, in a big story. And sometimes we miss the common everyday reasons why there's a problem. So, um, but many times there is a past life issue that is bleeding over into a lifetime. I've seen with humans and it does help to address that. But anyway, it's not like the big, I just want to be careful when I answer that because everybody then starts, you know, what is my dog's past life? And sometimes it doesn't matter. I don't get a past life from every animal that I talk to. It's just if it's pertinent to something I'm working on. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, do you think when animals are here, they're thinking about what's going to happen when I die and, you know, these existential questions that we think about as humans or do you think they just are – so in the here and now that that's not even relevant to them. So <laughs> there are two parts of that question and it's a really good one. Um, animals uh, do have a sense of time. So they do have a sense of past, present, future. Uh, they do though live very much in the present moment. That's what animals are really, really good at. And they can teach us a lot because humans go crazy the other way. We either um, have anxiety about <laughs> things that we're worried about that's going to happen in the future, or we're lamenting about things that happened in the past, and that's usually where we hang out. We're usually either thinking about stuff from the past or worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow or 15 years from now, um, and not living in the moment. So animals are really good about living in the moment. It doesn't mean that they don't think about the future or they don't have issues with the past, but they don't languish there. And um, so I don't come down to the barn and find, you know, 15 horses with anxiety wondering, you know, in two months from now, how bad is the winter going to be? <laughs> you know? They just don't do that. Um, now, as far as past things go, as we've talked about in a couple of the other videos um, from past weeks, they do deal with traumas and PTSD and, and um, they have situations like that that can impact them on still with what they're dealing with today. So it, it just, it really varies, but they don't hang around worrying um, about just about things like we do. That's a real human thing, and it's a debilitating human thing. And animals actually really worry about us for when we're doing that. They they really do. They're like, can't you just be with me right now? 
<laughs> and not be thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or five years from now. So, mm. yeah. Okay, that's so interesting. Um, well, you kind of touched on this topic, but another question that was brought up was about animals that have been through an extreme um, case of cruelty or yeah. really extreme trauma. And, you know, do they ever fully get over it? How can we help them heal, especially in the case of like, maybe we're still seeing the signs that they're being affected by it. There's something that's triggering them. Sure. Um, how can we help them? So another multi-layered question. Um, animals definitely are affected by past trauma. I'm not going to say that they're not. They also have an ability to heal um, from their trauma generally quicker than humans do. And I think I've said this in other videos as well, but um, we have to be careful. I think the biggest takeaway for this that I would like to get across is if you do have an animal that you know came from a cruelty situation um, or a neglect situation or just a, you know, a nasty situation with somebody, and you know you, that for sure your animal has been through that, just be aware of that. But there are a number of things that we do that actually keep them in the trauma. And that's what I would really like to talk about because there are some pitfalls with that. Um, one of them is that we as humans have this thing about, I rescued my dog. Um, and please don't say you rescued your dog from the shelter. <laughs> because the shelter has actually rescued your dog from a situation and you adopted them from the shelter. But the shelter wasn't the bad place that you rescued them from. Um, so, uh, but we have... Um, so we adopt an animal, and one of the things we like to do is we keep introducing that animal as my abuse case animal that I rescued, because it makes us feel good. But inadvertently, we are um, making them, uh, we're keeping them in the trauma. We're like, we're bringing that into their daily experience. They're with you now. They're loved. They're healing, you know, they're physically, maybe their physical situation is, you know, dramatically better. And you keep introducing them, oh, this was my dog. He was starved when I first got him. He was skin and bones and you should have seen him. And he's been so afraid. He was just totally afraid of everything. And we keep bringing that up and making it like it's in the present. And we keep that part of them alive unnecessarily. Where they've moved on potentially, but we then keep them in that trauma. So we have to be really careful with that. We're very cognizant of that here. Um, on our, if you go into our horse barn, for example, uh, most of our horses and donkeys, the vast majority of them, I think maybe all but one or two at this point, are here from animal cruelty cases, and their stories are horrific. I mean, each one of them has, you know, some sort of horrific story that we could share. But you won't see that on their signs. Every stall has a sign on it telling a little bit about the animal. And I also have a quote from that animal on each sign. And what the quote is, is I have asked them, what do you want people to know about you? And, and I take what they say and I put it on their sign um, because it's not um, helpful if I put their histories on there. I learned this the hard way because I used to, we used to do that here. And everybody told us when we first started in this business, you know, put their stories on their signs because people will want to donate, you know, when they hear what happened. And it was making our horses depressed. You know, people would come in, they'd read the sign, they wouldn't even look at the horse. They'd read the sign and say, oh, I can't deal with that, I can't deal with that. And they would walk away. And the horses would be like, geez, thanks, Don. You know, uh, they're not even looking at us or saying hello. Now people come in to our barn and they're like, oh, look at this one. Oh, look at this one. And the animals are like thrilled to share themselves with all these visitors that come through. That's what we want to see. That's their healing. You know, that's, that's the part of them that that found new purpose here. So it's really, really important that you let your animal heal from the trauma. Yeah, and it's kind of like silly to think about if I'm with my mom somewhere and she's introducing me to her friend and she's like, this is my daughter. She got in a terrible car accident five years exactly. ago. That would be so strange. Exactly. We don't do that. We don't do that with each other. You know, this is my friend Mary. She was horribly abused as a kid. And she has a lot of insecurities and anxiety issues, but we love her anyway. <laughs> I mean, we don't do that, yeah. but we do it freely with our animals all the time. And uh, we just need to really be careful of that because that does keep them alive in the trauma. 
and they will relive those emotions. That does trigger them. Um, as far as an animal that gets triggered and how to help an animal that gets triggered, um, anything you can do that just love them and um, once they're, when they do get triggered on something, uh, then move them away from that situation and reassure them. And it, again, with time, that really does heal and they get better from that. Now, there are some animals. The other caution here is I have people a lot of times um, say, you know, my dog is terrified of brooms. Obviously, he was beat by one. It must be because he's terrified of brooms. I have a dog that I've had from a puppy, and she was not beaten by anybody with a broom. But if the broom even moves one iota or some one of us picks up the broom, she starts barking hysterically at it. You know, <laughs> But she was not abused. So sometimes we make these um, assumptions that are not correct. And that also doesn't work in their favor. Instead, try to do something to, like now we're, we're trying to um, make it the broom a friendly thing. You know, when we're trying to help this dog because she just has a fear of the broom. For, she doesn't like the sound when you sweep is what her problem is. But anyway, um, we have to be careful of assigning them something that isn't true as well. Mm. Yes, it seems like the assumptions we make and the perspective we have really affects them. But on the flip side, we can start assuming positive things right. about them. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, so another question sort of switching gears a little bit is about, is around euthanasia. Mm. Um, and a lot of us have been through this where we make the decision to euthanize an animal and then after we feel guilty and in our head we think, are they mad at me? <laughs> right. Do they understand why I did this? Did I make the right decision? Um, how can we sort of cope with those questions? So let me start off by saying that, I mean, obviously it's the toughest decision as, as animal lovers and animal uh, people, I don't want to say animal owners, but uh, that we have to make. End of life decisions are just at, by their very nature, um, stressful, grueling, painful. However, what I tell people all the time is that when you're anticipating, you know, my animal's getting really old or debilitated and, and uh, I know that I'm, it's coming, you know, I'm, I'm going to probably have to make this decision. The anticipatory grief over that is just as real as, uh, as anything. And we put ourselves through hell with that. Um, it's really helpful to tune into your animal and see, just feel what they're feeling. Just if, when you really try to distance yourself from your feelings from it, I'm not saying you, you're not supposed to feel anything. You will feel all sorts of things. I do. I mean, just because I can communicate with them doesn't make that process like any easier. I go through the same process everybody else does. The thing is that when you tune into your animal, a lot of times that animal is very comfortable and okay with the process they're going through. They understand that they're dying. I've not ever talked to an animal afraid to die. And um, it doesn't mean they don't get afraid of how they will die. But the, the death process itself, they, they are comfortable with that. Um, so they, it's, it's a process that they, if you, if you stick with what they're feeling, if you tune into them and see that they're actually okay, um, what that can settle you. But the other thing that happens is, uh, we feel enormous angst leading up to this. Like, is it the right time? Is it, the, how will I know it's the right time? What am I going to do? I do that too. So even though I'm an animal communicator, I still will find myself like getting myself worked up and then I have to take a breath, say, okay, wait a minute, where is this animal? Where am I at with this animal? I just went through this personally, so I'll share this, um, with a cat that was 20 years old and he was um, failing. I mean, he was 20 and he was failing, but he was really comfortable. So just because he was 20 and I knew it was coming, you know, I'm going to have to do this. I was getting myself worked up, watching him every second, feeling angst, talking to my veterinarians and saying, I don't know, can you come and look at him? Maybe this is it. And finally, you know, he was really relaxed about it, completely relaxed about it. And what I tell people is when you're feeling all of that turmoil, that's usually your turmoil. Um, and if you can catch yourself and just realize that's your turmoil about going through this, when the day comes when it's time for the euthanasia, it's never easy, but there's a knowing that happens and it's different. You'll shift and you feel like, okay, today's, this is it. I, he's ready. Like they'll let you know when they're ready. Now, back to your question. 
Um, it is a, a very unfortunately normal human response to, and I say unfortunately because the animals don't do this and our loved ones when they pass don't want us doing this, but it is a very natural process to go back in your head and second guess. It's like when you know in your heart it was the right time, you go through the process, you go through the euthanasia, you go through, you start the grief, but immediately your brain starts telling you, maybe that wasn't the right time. Maybe you shouldn't have done that. Maybe I was making a wrong decision. Maybe I did it for the wrong reasons. And you start beating yourself up. And that's a human process that happens where we start second guessing everything. And I try as an animal communicator, you know, for, for 30 years, I've worked with many, many hundreds, thousands of, of people going through this process. And the way I help them is to reconnect them to that animal because you can still reach them in spirit. And I think the thing to know is that your hearts are always connected. I said this in another video, but your hearts are always connected. That love is very real. It transcends the physical. And when you think of them in spirit, they feel you and vice versa. You'll suddenly, you know, feel like yourself out of nowhere thinking of them. And that's them sending you, um, love and, 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 um, uh, just, trying to let you know they're okay. So if we open and let that in, um, our heads will quiet down eventually. But that's a very normal process. It's just part of the grieving process. Yeah, and just because you're in turmoil about it and it's really sad doesn't mean that it was the wrong decision. Correct, yeah. Yeah, and afterwards, um, when an animal transitions, I'm thinking that they, they understand what happened and why it happened, and maybe they're even grateful that you ease their transition. Absolutely. I always tell people this, when you feel that feeling like it's just, you just know it, it's not you just making that decision. You're making it with the animal. Your, your animal is telling you it's okay. You know, it's okay. I'm ready. And that's when that feeling comes. It's like, you know, but yes, they, they, um, they totally understand. Mm. Yeah. And so it's just, you need to trust yourself and trust your animal and Go through the natural grief. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. I have only, in all the thousands of consultations I've done, and it's many thousands, I've only had one animal, I take that back, two, two animals that were upset. Um, one was a euthanasia and the other one actually was a cruelty case. So um, that, that they were upset as to how they died. But mm -hmm. the euthanasia one, um, is a story that I will tell because it was a horse who was being euthanized and it was the trainer who contacted me, not the owner. But the trainer had no decision, no say in, the, in any decision. She was just the trainer that was hired to work with this horse, but she was wildly upset because this horse was being euthanized. And the reason the horse, it was a perfectly healthy horse, but the reason why the horse was being euthanized is um, they were breeding her and the babies weren't the right color that they wanted. And instead of selling her, which they could have done, um, they were in a highly competitive, um, uh, whatever discipline they were in, they were highly competitive. And the babies that she did have were extremely athletic. They just were the wrong color. So they didn't want to sell her for somebody else to breed because they would be showing against those babies. And, um, this mare was incredibly upset and outraged that that was going to happen to her. And admittedly, I had a hard time with that because I was also, it's very upsetting for me. And to then try to prepare her because I was called on a Friday. She was being euthanized on Monday. So, um, but this lovely trainer was um, asking what she could do to help her through this process. So we, we did have a whole consultation on that. And in the end, um, the mare ended up being okay, but she was still angry about it and resentful. And that, that was a human betrayal that was very difficult for her. Well, luckily that's not, you know. That's not the norm. norm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying I use that example because it's extreme um, because that's how unusual it would, it would be that an animal would be upset about somebody making that decision. Right. So when yeah. it's, you know, your own personal pets, it's a, it's a yeah. different story. And, and animals get our intentions. Yeah. And when we're, we're doing a euthanasia in a loving manner, it is that intention is what, you know, they, they get that. Yeah. 
Yeah, they know we love them. Yes. Mm. So interesting. Okay, thank you, Don. You're welcome. That was awesome. Well, again, um, for anyone listening, if you missed the beginning, you can go back and watch the replay in just a second. And you can also put questions in the comments, and we'll talk about them next week. Great. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us.